Hello and welcome to this Lit in 5 video on contexts in The Great Gatsby. A brilliant novel, one of my favourites, I have to confess. Now, whenever I go on YouTube and look at what's out there to help literature students, uh, the videos I tend to find, most of them tend to be on context. Uh, a massive majority of them, if not all of them, uh, tend to waffle on about social this, cultural this, historical that, biographical this, which is all well and good, and some students might find use for that. However, uh, what I've done is I've given you some relevant contexts, but what the other videos don't seem to do, I've linked them to moments and quotations from the Great Gatsby. Uh, the text is your primary concern. It is what you are tested on. So context exists to illuminate your reading and your study of the literary text, whether that's a poem, whether that's a play, whether that's a novel, uh, not just to drop in for what examiners call bolt on context, which makes them groan uh, and not give you very many marks. So yet yeah, context is there to illuminate your reading of the literary text. But also, you can then use the literary text to see what the writer might be saying back to or at the context from which the literary work is born out of. So hopefully that's one better than you usually get with your typical YouTube video on the context of a literary text. So, as ever, five areas, lit in five. Uh, these are the five we're going to be exploring here. So, number one, the lost generation, two, the jazz age, three, the American dream linked to social mobility, four, advertising in cars, and five, women in Fitzgerald's writing. Now, all of these five areas are taken up in tremendous detail in the language video and possibly in some of the form and structure video content as well. So be sure to check those out. They are extremely beneficial to your close analysis of the text. Okay, so our first concept here is afforded to us by a lady called Gertrude Stein, a feminist thinker, and she coined the term the lost generation. So I'm not going to read you through everything on the screen. You can pause that and do that for yourself. There is an area I do want to focus on, uh, and this is the idea of being a post-World War I culture. So surviving the Great War, the war to end all wars, that worked really well, uh, gives rise to a generation of people who are lost. So in, in a sense of what do we do now? We've survived the war to end all wars. We're still alive. We've fought off this evil tyranny. What do we do with our lives now? Who are we? So if you look around here, you can see after World War I, uh, America arguably becomes submerged in disillusionment. A sense of purposelessness, very important for the great Gatsby, scepticism, cultural experimentation, the Jazz Age, and hedonism, the Jazz Age. So we've survived. It's time to party. It's time to let our hair down. And we've had austerity and threats of death. And, you know, we could have been snuffed out as a race or a species or a culture. It's time to kick back and enjoy ourselves. So, uh, I thought it was a nice little quote to bring in here from Fitzgerald himself, which is something I'll try and do in this context video. So what Fitzgerald uh, thinks about the Jazz Age or thinks about the Lost Generation, better to get these quotes straight from the horse's mouth, I think. He is the writer we are looking at. So his take on the Jazz Age or the Lost Generation, I think, is more beneficial or most beneficial. So in, the, in this side of paradise, 1920, five years before The Great Gatsby is released, uh, Fitzy writes of a new generation, quote, grown up to find all gods dead, all wars fought, and all faiths in man shaken. So you can see why we're talking about disillusionment here, a sense of purposelessness. We've gone beyond the final chapter because we've survived the Great War. What comes after the final chapter? So it's very much a lost generation, as Stein called it. This purposelessness of the lost generation then manifests itself in certain characters, notably Daisy, we'll show you in a moment, in a sense of ennui, a lovely French word, a feeling of utter weariness and discontent resulting from a lack of satisfaction uh, or being overly satisfied, reaching peak satisfaction and having nothing left to crave 
uh, or strive for or desire, uh, which can result in boredom. To illustrate this, have a look at this moment from chapter one in the novel. So uh, we meet Daisy and Jordan Baker here. A little bit of dialogue from Daisy we have. In two weeks, it'll be the longest day in the year. Do you always watch for the longest day of the year and then miss it? I always watch for the longest day in the year and then miss it. So uh, referring to that idea of having maximum daylight, the longest day of the year, Daisy's life is nothing more than looking for when there is the maximum amount of daylight, the so-called longest day of the year, and that's what she does with her days. Okay, so an absolute sense of purposelessness, uh, no direction, uh, part of which... Uh, sees Fitzgerald putting his satirical hat on here. As we mentioned in the form and structure video, this is a satirical novel, so be sure to check that out, please. Frequently in this chapter you see yawning associated with Jordan Baker as well, and she speaks up here and replies to Daisy, we ought to plan something. And Daisy replies, all right, what'll we plan? She turned to me helplessly. What do people plan? Now, uh, that's a perfect illustration, in my opinion, in chapter one there, of that purposelessness and that lost generation. A large portion of this is, of course, to do with how affluent and how moneyed uh, these two characters are. So they've reached maximum or peak satisfaction. Uh, their life is devoid of meaning, purpose and intent. Just have a little zoom in on uh, what do people plan. Uh, it's almost speaking of other people as though they're an alien race, a different species, and that these moneyed people, this lost generation, are above that. They are above people, uh, what is later referred to as the hot struggles of the poor. A further way in the novel we witness the lost generation is uh, to do with the ideas of hedonism. Uh, reckless pleasure, materialism, uh, indulging yourself to the point of excess in whatever vice or pleasure you enjoy. This form of being lost also overlaps with the jazz age as well, so we'll go into that in a little more detail later. This is the era of a post-war economic boom, it's also the era of prohibition as well, but strangely once you ban and prohibit something, the demand and the desire for it increases. So we'll talk about speakeasies later and all of the money that was invested in alcohol manufacturing. One of the many celebrated things about the novel, of course, are the chapters detailing Gatsby's fantastic parties. So in terms of the lost generation, hedonism and the jazz age, it's only right we have a little look at a moment from one of Gatsby's parties. So a nice moment here to illustrate the sense in which the lost generation are lost through hedonism and excess. So from chapter three here. Every Friday, five crates of oranges and lemons arrived from New York. Every Monday, these same oranges and lemons left his back door in a pyramid of pulpless halves. Okay, a lovely symbolic metaphor there, uh, obviously nodding towards the idea of juice or being juiced, some 1920s slang there for being drunk. Uh, what you have is a lovely symbol of consumption there. So in they come through the, uh, the front door, presumably, uh, they are spent of their juice or their substance or their content, and they leave the back door empty and hollowed out. Uh, imagine a sort of scene of hungover, drunken partygoers the morning after, or that very same evening, if you look at some of Gatsby's parties. Some even don't make the following morning. Look at the speed and the ease of consumption here as well. Uh, just the push of a button could extract the juice of 200 oranges in half an hour if a little button was pressed 200 times by a butler's thumb. So this is excess, this is pleasure, this is abandon, hedonism on tap at the mere touch of a button uh, and consumed a great quantity and speed. I like the little nod back towards the war and the fact that this is a post-war lost generation here. So we see at least once a fortnight a core military word of caterers. So we're not looking at men now fighting for liberty and freedom. We're looking at people who come and feed 
uh, this hedonism in this wonderful Gatsby party. Of course, there ain't no party like a Gatsby party. Look at the exotica here. Look, spice baked hams. Uh, pastry pigs, turkeys bewitched to a dark gold, a little hint at the wealth and the money on show here, uh, a real brass rail, not fake, uh, this is the genuine item, uh, and stocked with gins and liquors and cordials so long forgotten that most of his female guests were too young to know. So everything on tap here, things you have never seen in this land of wonder and hedonistic excess. When you read to the end of chapter 3 as well, another way in which the people in this novel are lost, part of the lost generation, is all the domestic squalor and fighting that takes place at the end of chapter 3. Nick notes towards the end, I looked around. Most of the remaining women were now having fights with men said to be their husbands. So adultery and affairs is part of the sort of decay of morality. Uh, in this post-war America of Fitzgerald's creation. I also want to bring in this second quote here relating to Myrtle Wilson, just to show that this sense of being lost through hedonism, through acquiring items and possessions, materialism and recklessness is something that cuts across all levels of society in Fitzgerald's novel. So obviously Myrtle doesn't move in the circles of being invited to one of Gatsby's parties, but these qualities are still on show within a character of lower social class. So this is the moment where Myrtle tells Nick whether he wants to hear it or not, he doesn't, about her first meeting with Tom. So Myrtle obviously spies Tom on the train and they're obviously exchanging desirous glances with each other. We have a lot to say about this on the language video in terms of materialism. But just for now, uh, look how Myrtle is eyeing the appearance and the wealth that is on show in terms of Tom and his appearance. His dress suit, his patent leather shoes. And then, straight after that, very, very purposely by Fitzgerald, I couldn't keep my eyes off him. It's because he represents a higher social class and a chance to gain social mobility and to have someone more affluent as her man, if you like. The extent to which Tom is Myrtle's man is very open to debate. Um, it's more so that Myrtle is Tom's girl, but we'll talk about that in another video. Uh, and f It is absolutely deliberate that Fitzgerald says, I had to pretend, this is Myrtle obviously, to be looking at the advertisement over his head. So that juxtaposition is very important as Myrtle eyes Tom up and looking at the wealth and the social background he belongs to with his dress and his fine clothes. There is an advertisement located in shot, if you like. He represents the higher social class that Myrtle is so very keen to belong to. Look at the recklessness down the bottom as well. She's a married woman. Uh, morality is in decline in this lost generation. And as she recounts to Nick here, all I kept thinking about over and over was, you can't live forever. You can't live forever. So there's that recklessness. There's that abandon. There's that to hell with it attitude to take what you can in the now because life is worth living to the utmost so there's your hedonism uh, and ways in which these characters absolutely form part of what Stein would call the lost generation, regardless of which social class you belong to. So, the Jazz Age. In a moment, we're going to look at some of Fitzgerald's own words uh, in which he characterises and explains and explores the Jazz Age. But before we do that, uh, it's very important, I think, to get a flavour of what the period was about. So, let's have a little video. Heartbeat, burns heavily, nearly makes furnace out of me. Heartbeat, and I want to be hot, 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 hot,
Okay, so there's a great essay which is very findable online from Google, where the search engines are available, uh, by Fitzgerald called Echoes of the Jazz Age. Now, as you can see there, it was written in 1931. So this is a great essay because it's Fitzgerald looking back on the period labelled the Jazz Age. In the early 1930s, of course, America starts to hit a great economic depression. So the economic boom after World War I has been enjoyed with partying and hedonism and increased social mobility. But now we've had the Wall Street crash. So in another way, this is a brilliant essay because it's a retrospective. It's Fitzgerald looking back at a period he has enjoyed, but could also see great problems and flaws with uh, when it's over. Uh, and is now just starting to become a memory. So let's have a little go through some of the quotes on screen uh, to help identify some characteristics of the Jazz Age, according to Fitzy himself. Interesting to note in the first quote here, so if you look at the pointer on screen, uh, this is a period Fitzgerald regards as one which gave him referring to himself here, more money than he had ever dreamed of, simply for telling people that he felt as they did. So a time of great affluence is something we can obviously identify here, which is also shown in the novel. A key quote here in the second quotation, it was an age of miracles. It was an age of art, it was an age of excess, and it was an age of satire. So as we mentioned in the form and structure video, this is a satirical novel. But look at the sense of possibility here, an age of miracles, and of course, wild partying and hedonism, excess in Fitzgerald's own words. Continuing that theme, he labels America at that time, certainly in his uh, perception of it, as a whole race going hedonistic, deciding on pleasure. If you look back at the first quote, uh, this is the natural outpouring or consequence of all the, quote, nervous energy stored up and unexpended in the war. Then he continues, in any case, the Jazz Age now raced along under its own power, served by great filling stations of money. In the language video, which I'm obviously very keen for you to check out, uh, we're going to pick up on this idea of uh, raced along under its own power. So we have the motor car, we have the radio, we have recordable music on vinyl, we have all the alcohol you can locate, even though it's supposed to be prohibited. Uh, so you're definitely getting an idea of why the period was also called the Roaring Twenties. Life uh, lived at an extremely fast, hedonistic pace. Uh, there's no living for tomorrow. You live for today. Uh, and you sort of almost have a carpe diem mentality in terms of get your pleasure while you can, as much as you can, as quickly as you can. The nice metaphor of the great filling stations of money again. So there's a little another reminder of that affluence on show. Uh, and then you get this sense of retrospective here. So uh, according to Fitzgerald, by 1929, what he calls the most expensive orgy in history was over. 
So some very quotable quotes there. And again, I think they're really important because it's coming from the writer himself in this case. I just wanted to add a final quote there from the Echoes of the Jazz Age. So this paragraph very much has that idea of looking back in an almost elegiac way, a sense of mourning of what has been lost. Not total mourning, uh, you can see here some references to wasted youth. Uh, so, much like Nick Carraway in the novel, the narrator in The Great Gatsby, uh, a lot, I think, of Fitzgerald's own mindset is represented through Nick. So um, there's a great quote that Nick says, I was both without and within. So a simultaneous sort of amazement at the hedonistic pleasure of the Jazz Age, but also a little bit repulsed and appalled by it as well, an ambivalent attitude. So we're getting that in this retrospective reflection here as well. There's a sense of youthful vigour and possibility attached to the youthful generation here as well. Uh, it seemed only a question of a few years before the older people would step aside and let the world be run by those who saw things as they were. So look at the sense of exuberance and youthful possibilities there. Uh, the youth during the Jazz Age period. Fitzgerald's only really talking about a nine-year period here, really. So 1920, the roaring. 20s and he classifies this as being over by 1929 so this is uh, comparatively in the history of time a short burst an intense period of nine years of hedonistic excess possibility partying pleasure joy which then naturally or maybe uh, understandably fizzles out that pace and that intensity could not be sustained uh, there's that sense at the beginning as well of this paragraph here of the sort of Great Depression coming and the um, Wall Street crash. Now once more the belt is tightened and we summon the proper expression of horror as we look back at our wasted youth. So a tinge of regret there I think. Uh, so there's that ambivalence. It was an age of immense possibility but now he looks back with the regret. A further contextual aspect here is looking at the novel in terms of the American dream. Uh, critics have called the novel uh, as one, have referred to the novel as one which strikes a cautionary tale towards the mythology and the ideology of the American dream. So you can see the illusion or reality. Uh, many great American writers explore the idea of this deadly illusion uh, as something which is supposedly attainable, but causes the ruin and destruction of many of their characters as they pursue it. So if you know of Mice and Men uh, from Steinbeck, if you know Death of a Salesman, brilliant, brilliant play by Arthur Miller, uh, lots of American writers are concerned with showing the dangerous illusions of American dream ideology. I'm just going to correct the punctuation and the grammar of that particular meme as well, because that's infuriating. OK, more about the American dream and how it's arguably treated in the novel. Moving on. Two very important concepts here in relation to the American Dream, which pertains to the novel The Great Gatsby and the character Gatsby. So, first of all, is the classic one that you'll have heard countless times, uh, the idea of America being the land of opportunity, one which enables social mobility. You see that in numerous forms of literature, historical, cultural documents. Uh, even if you want to look at it in film, have a look at a brilliant Scorsese film film called The Gangs of New York so DiCaprio in that arrives at America, into America sorry, and the second he comes off the boat there's a leaflet thrust in his hand uh, offering him the chance of work and paid employment as he flees Ireland so that's the sort of thing we're dealing with here but lots of writers are very very quick to critique and socially sorry, satirically critique uh, the danger of this notion if you're familiar with works such as Of Mice and Men and Death of a Salesman, uh, the characters in those two novels, they are in a ex an exhausting and kind of tragic, fatal pursuit 
of wealth and money and the means to exist and thrive in the supposed land of opportunity. The Great Gatsby is quite different in the sense that we have someone who, strictly speaking, by the letter of the law, uh, or the you know the the letter of American ideology as the land of opportunity has made it. Gatsby's got more money than you could ever hope for, and yet we still see failures associated with that. So we're kind of the flip side of Of Mice and Men and Death of a Salesman. We have incredible affluence here, gold books, real brass rails, uh, a house that glows uh, with lights and almost putting the daylight into the shade in terms of how much it glows. But we still see that idea of something being unobtainable and satisfaction and happiness being beyond reach. There is plenty on that in the language video. Second of all uh, in this idea of the American dream is the concept of the self-made man. So um, someone who gets there and rises to the top and realises opportunity uh, from their own steam, their own hard work, their own blood, sweat and tears, uh, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Just a little reference back to Death of a Salesman there as well. It's a brilliant play, super tragic and extremely moving. Uh, but there's a, a line in there from the protagonist, the tragic hero, Willie Loman, who can't believe his son Biff is lost in quote unquote in the greatest country in the world. So uh, that really reinforces that sense that you know anything is possible, supposedly for anyone. Uh, in the greatest country in the world. That would be a good little quote to spike in uh, in your essays to reinforce the dangers of that ideology of the land of opportunity. Moving on. Okay, so a little sort of summary of the land of opportunity, specifically in relation to the great Gatsby here. So obviously I'm not going to read through all of that. There's also a word I've missed out there that I'm going to scroll in now, my bad. Uh, the key thing here is down the bottom. Uh, migrants and Native Americans believed that in the US they could do anything that they put their minds to. So post-World War One, economic boom, a time of tremendous possibility to increase one's wealth, one's standing, uh, through illegal means, quite possibly as well, through prohibition, but that's still a form of opportunity, if you like. Uh, the young James Gatz, a.k.a. Gatsby, believed in this same dream and believed that he could obtain anything, even love, with money. So they're just getting a bit more specific to the world of the great Gatsby and the land of opportunity. Very different, as I mentioned before, in terms of mice and men and death of a salesman. Uh, the protagonist here has tremendous wealth already, but then the notion of love enters the mix in amongst this idea of money and enormous wealth. So, an era of tremendous optimism and possibility. Uh, the second paragraph here says, it seemed as if any person, I want to focus on that in a moment, could rise to become a member of the social or economic elite. Uh, one of the things you hear about American dream ideology and the land of opportunity ideology is that any native-born American that's the only criteria for being president of America, could grow up to become the president of America. So if you're sat there watching television, eating spray cheese from a can, yes, absolutely, you sir, you madam, you can become the president of America. POTUS, as I believe it is called these days. Uh, you see here as well, it was a decade obsessed with superlatives, being the most beautiful, the most powerful, the most wealthy. So we've included a, cup, a copy of Vogue here. So we start to see celebrity culture and the worship of beauty uh, on a scale not seen previously. I've also included an image there from the film The Wolf of Wall Street, which is obviously not the 1920s, but there are some very interesting parallels in terms of the 1980s and new money and the yuppie and playing the financial markets, which obviously has some overlap with uh, Nick, Nick Carraway, uh, working in finance as well. And here from The Wolf of Wall Street, you can literally see a person covered literally in money. So that's obviously a key element of the novel where and my language video as well where characters people identity 
cannot be separated from the wealth they command or the wealth they have. People are what they own. People's identity is related to the amount of wealth they can exhibit or demonstrate. All this helps to reinforce how the novel is a satirical critique of American dream ideology and the reason why many commentators and people who analyse the novel regard this as a cautionary tale regarding American dream ideology. George and Lenny and Willie Lohman pursue and pursue and pursue, never get there, fail and don't want to do too many spoilers but their fate is their fate. Gatsby has achieved that, so you would expect a story of success. Obviously, that is not the case. And secondly, in this idea of the American dream, is the notion of the self-made man. So that's one that's deeply rooted in the American dream. The archetype, the typical version of this, would be someone coming from low origins, Jay Gatz, who, against all odds meets Dan Cody, breaks out of his inherited social position, kind of nowhere really, climbs up the social ladder, please watch the language video, particularly some of the imagery from chapter 6, as we start to see the first meeting between the young Jay Gatz and the young Daisy Faye, as she was then, and creates a new identity for himself. Well, Jay Gatz becomes Gatsby, uh, and many forms of Gatsby. Is he related to the German SS? Is he this kind of person? Is he that kind of person? And so on. Key factors in this rise from rags to riches are hard work. Well, debatable in terms of Gatsby. This one is definitely debatable, and a solid moral foundation. So, obviously, the sale of alcohol is deeply prohibited at this time. So, when you've, we've, not, we've not got a character who tries to get there by an honest day's hard work. So, he differs slightly in terms of other versions of American protagonists and American literature trying to gain social mobility and prosper in the land of opportunity. Education for self-improvement was also a key factor. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Just a little interesting historical piece here. Uh, Prohibition left the door open for opportunists of all types. So there is a way. You could argue it's smart business acumen. Uh, If you've seen the series on Sky as well, Boardwalk Empire, uh, there's a Nucky Thompson in there, which is a brilliant series, who is kind of a mogul. He's, He's the man. Uh, and he makes his tremendous wealth via prohibition and bootlegging and selling alcohol. So sort of very inspired by Gatsby there. I love this fact, but I'm also kind of frightened by it as well. It is estimated that over $500 million (laughs) went from the hands of farmers, brewers and distributors into the hands of organised crime during prohibition. Even by today's standards, even in an era of Donald Trump, $500 million is not an amount to be sneezed at. Oh my goodness. So, a roaring trade in booze, once booze has been banned. Please drink responsibly. With regards to the self-made man, here is an important section from the end of the novel when Gatsby's father arrives, even though his son is dead, uh, and... uh, Mr. Gatz uh, shows this to Nick Carraway. This is something that uh, is in Gatsby's own handwriting. Now, in light of the previous stuff on self-improvement, hard work, uh, changing your identity, improving oneself in the land of opportunity, the self-made man, look at this list. This is Gatsby's to-do list, if you like. Rise from bed, 6am. Dumbbell exercise and wall scaling, all itemised and sectioned out. Uh, in an itinerary of self-improvement. Study electricity, work, a larger portion of the day, baseball and sports. Practice elocution, poise, and how to attain it. So, becoming someone different um, in the manner of sort of um, a finishing school, almost. Uh, Resolves or ambitions, if you like. No more smoking or chewing. I think a little pointed irony there from Fitzgerald that the young Gatsby has spelled smoking wrong, so not quite fully there. Uh, And then this quote from a very proud father. Uh, It just shows you. Uh, It just shows you, don't it? Jimmy was bound to get ahead. He 
he always had some resolves like this or something. So uh, there's very much an idea of the self-made man being a possibility to change one's identity in America. The last little quote here from Nick Carraway as well. I think he, Gatsby's dad, rather expected me to copy down the list for my own use. Slight into satire in there as well, as though the plan and the blueprint that the young Jay Gats had uh, is some kind of nationwide or universal blueprint for success in the land of opportunity. The dad possibly thinks that this is the secrets of unlocking the universe and the supposed tremendous happiness that comes with attaining obscene wealth. Fitzgerald, I think, suggests otherwise in the novel. So two key concepts there which underpin the idea of the American dream uh, and two important ingredients of that ideology there. So the land of opportunity where everything is possible in America. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and the notion of the self-made man, which is also extremely possible in the land of opportunity. Moving to our fourth of five on context, here in Lit in Five, we're looking now at advertising and cars. So I've reproduced uh, that quote from Echoes of the Jazz Age again from Fitzgerald. In any case, the Jazz Age now raced along under its own power, served by great filling stations of money. And a second quotation there, which isn't from Fitzgerald's essay, but is a nice, alliterative, memorable sort of quote. Uh, the Jazz Age, the Roaring Twenties, as the age of flappers, Fords, you see the motor car there, and fanatics in terms of their jazz hedonism. Uh, jazz was obviously regarded as some kind of corrupting influence, much in the same way in the 60s, rock and roll and Elvis and the Beatles would have been regarded as corrupting the youth of today. So the motor car becomes available uh, during this period. Not to all, of course. Uh, it's a tremendously expensive item uh, and you wouldn't be able to afford one if you are the regular working class members of America at this time. But obviously we have Tom Buchanan who has one, of course, and Gatsby who has one, which almost borders on the fantastical. Uh, it's almost like the TARDIS, if you know Doctor Who. There's so many things attached to it and somehow manages to be housed within one automobile. It almost defies the law of physics, really, if you read the introduction of the car. So I'm raising this idea of the motor car in terms of, well, two things, really. Uh, one, to get across the idea of hedonistic, pleasurable living. Uh, this is obviously not a photo, the image in the left-hand side of the screen here. But look at the joy uh, and abandon on those people. There are legs dangling out of the car. They're whizzing along at tremendous speed. Hats are off. Uh, I think there's a stocking on show there to show the abandon and the carefree just pleasure and sort of recklessness, I guess, uh, that the motor car brings. Obviously, we have alcohol as well. There are no such things as drink driving laws during the Roaring Twenties. So, you can be li listening to your jazz on your radio uh, or on your uh, vinyl and you can transport it around and listen to it. You can drink your illegal whiskey, you can have the jazz floating around your head and you can get in a motor car with mad jazz racing through your brains as you push your accelerator down uh, and have the road to yourself. So want to reiterate the idea of do not drink and drive, do not drink at all and then get in charge of a car, but during this period there is obviously no such banning of this. So a time of wild excess and freedom. The second reason I raise that is because in the language video I'm going to show you some very interesting treatment of driving language and driving metaphors to see that as Fitzgerald's reflection uh, of the Jazz Age and a critique of the Jazz Age. So there's an important bit of context which will make more sense once you have a look at the close language analysis in the language video. As we've mentioned, it's a period of economic boom, so wealth is aplenty, 
Uh, it's a time of feast, not famine. Uh, famine comes later in the 1930s and the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression. Uh, a useful concept here by a sociologist called Thornstein Veblen. He coined the phrase conspicuous consumption. So obviously you can read the definition of that, but it's best to think of that in today's bling. So people who wear labels and designer labels where the name of the designer is almost the entirety of the garment so that you can see someone is wearing Armani because they want to be seen to be wearing Armani or Gucci or whatever. So this year has saw the birth of brand names as a sign of reliability and quality. Adverts go from informing what was available, they began to shape the tastes of the nation, not reflect them. This is very important in terms of the idea of the self-made man. So some critics have likened Gatsby's act of self-creation, Gats to Gatsby, as new packaging, a change of brand name to appeal to the, if you like, consumer, Daisy Fay, for whom money is, well, it's debatable whether Daisy actually can be said to genuinely have the feeling of love uh, does she see dollars and pound signs and that is what informs her notion of love in inverted commas so here's this period of economic boom uh, so the means to acquire items is fed by the advertising agency and that is taken wholeheartedly by America who begin to demonstrate consumerist and materialistic notions, arguably on a scale never seen before. An interesting bit of context here, uh, Fitzgerald's favourite title for the novel was Under the Red, White and Blue, obviously the American flag, but his editor urged a rethink of that. Perhaps this was a bit too near the knuckle uh, for the, um, uh, the editor, and he thought, no, no, we don't want to annoy or upset the patriotic uh, by an overt critique of America during the Jazz Age. So we'll call it something different, if you don't mind, Fitzy. OK, editor, we'll call it The Great Gatsby. So even though, maybe arguably, Fitzgerald backed down a little bit in terms of making the novel an overt critique of American consumerism and excess by renaming it, Gatsby is arguably a strong social critique of early 20th century America. I shop, therefore I am. I think the meme I've used there of I'm not a shopaholic, I think that's the actress Isla Fisher who goes on to play Myrtle Wilson in Baz Luhrmann's production. So that was an accident, but something that dawned on me later. Linked to this notion of advertising, we have the important symbol of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. And I've added again that quote from uh, The Side of Paradise from Fitzgerald. So uh, the key bit here is to find all gods dead. You might go as far, a possible interpretation here, AO5 linked to AO1, that the notion of God and morality, religious morality, spirituality, is dead in this novel. And so the substitute for that are a pair of eyes, which is, of course, an advert. The oculist, we call them opticians now, from Queens. They are the eyes watching over the Valley of the Ashes, looking at the marital decay and the adultery and death and materialism on show here. So this is a world, arguably, which has been abandoned by God, whatever your notion of God is. Uh, instead, it has been replaced or usurped uh, by an advert. So materialism is the new religion now, you could argue, in The Great Gatsby. So there's the quote uh, which introduces the advert or the billboard, to give it its proper American title, uh, of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. Point your attention towards evidently some wild wag of an oculist set them there to fatten his practice, to increase his wealth, uh, to increase his earnings, his spending power in the borough of Queens, and then sank down himself into eternal blindness, or forgot them, and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many paintless days under sun and rain, brewed on over the solemn dumping ground. An extremely bleak view of working class America here in the Valley of the Ashes. Obviously no such advertisement looms over the moneyed world of East Egg or West Egg. But this is arguably Fitzgerald's satirical reflection on the sort of wasteland a materialist jazz age America has become. Look at your references to dust, 
uh, obviously a, a dead limbo world here. Eternal blindness is perhaps Fitzgerald's reflection on an America blind towards its own consumerist dissent and depravity as well. More of that in the language video in relation to Gatsby of all people. And our fifth of five on context. So I'm going to be looking at the presentation of women in Fitzgerald's writing. Uh, to do that, I'm going to go away from The Great Gatsby for a moment to look at a couple of Fitzgerald's short stories. But I am then going to link that back to, with quotations, to The Great Gatsby. So we're going to be looking at two short stories, uh, both of which can be found online. Uh, one of which is The Cut Glass Bowl, and the second one, most importantly, is Winter Dreams, which is sort of an embryonic version of The Great Gatsby, uh, an idea that must have been circling around Fitzgerald's head before he goes and writes The Great Gatsby. So we're looking at four characteristics here, uh, which tend to crop up across his writing in terms of the presentation of females or female characters. Uh, one is the insubstantial nature of women. They're of no substance, they're empty and hollow, uh, which is linked to their materialism. Number two, uh, they're clearly attracted to wealth and affluent men. Uh, number three, they're rather fickle uh, and incapable of loyalty towards men, particularly when the area of money is involved. And number four, uh, they are presented, as we'll see, with this kind of bewitching smile and voice, uh, almost like putting a spell over men, with, uh, rich men, of course, uh, with their beauty and their appearance. And this usually amounts to doom and or ruin uh, for their male admirers. So we're clearly not getting a very complimentary presentation of women here, but this tends to be consistent across much of Fitzgerald's work. So the stuff I'm showing you now uh, qualifies in terms of literary context, which will also please the examiner for AO3. Uh, it shows you've done wider reading. Uh, it shows this presentation of women is not a one-off. It's something that's quite consistent, perhaps a motif across Fitzgerald's writing. Uh, so that's the benefit in terms of the examiner as well, some literary context. OK, so a quick quote from the opening of the cut glass bowl here. Uh, we have our main character, Evelyn, uh, who is married, uh, but she has kept uh, a gift from an admirer uh, from her days of being young, free and single. Uh, and many times throughout the story, she sort of pines or wishes to go back to the days where she's young, free and single. So the opening says here, uh, the glass bowl is a gift from a previous lover or admirer. It's described as as hard as she is and as beautiful and empty and as easy to see through. So that's important in establishing that idea of insubstantial, empty, shallow, hollow women who are beautiful to look at uh, on the exterior or the outside but in terms of their spirit or ideas of love or fidelity uh, they're hollow and empty on the inside they are insubstantial uh, and obsessed by the superficial or indeed characterised by the superficial their veneers OK, so let's see how this idea of lacking substance or being lacking in substance uh, appears in The Great Gatsby. So if you see here from this moment where Nick enters the Buchanan house and is first introduced or reunited I guess in the case of Daisy uh, with the two women, uh, look at this imagery to do with sort of floating and hovering. They were both in white and their dresses were rippling and fluttering as if they had just been blown back in after a short flight around the house. So I think what we're seeing here is definitely evidence of satire, definitely satirical critique of these two affluent women. And the idea, the kind of absurd hyperbole sort of in the metaphor that they can float uh, underneath that is a satirical criticism of they have no substance. They are almost disembodied and weightless because of the materialistic nature of their character. 
The two young women ballooned slowly to the floor. Uh, are they full of hot air? Are they insubstantial? Again, they have nothing of substance about them. You could take this in a further sense as well and look at the idea of white and rippling and floating and fluttering and flight around the house. There's something almost ghostly uh, about these women, something disembodied, not quite substantial or real. Uh, we will see when we look at Gatsby in chapter 5 some of the almost gothic notes Fitzgerald uses to describe the effect of wealth upon some of the very affluent characters. So maybe that idea of something supernatural or ghostly or disembodied is also there linked to that idea of the superficial, shallow and insubstantial nature of women and female characters. Okay, so looking at Winter Dreams, which is a great story. If you have the time, I'd recommend you have a little read of that. Uh, we're seeing this other character, second characteristic now of female characters in Fitzgerald's writing, namely this uh, blatant attraction uh, towards men of wealth or affluent men. So in modern terms, I guess we'd call this a gold digger. So don't go putting that in your essay, but yes, it reminds you of that song. You're thinking about it now, aren't you? Yes, you're singing it now in your head. Uh, but we are getting towards that idea of a beautiful woman uh, will zoom in on or make herself a predator towards uh, an affluent male. So here's the brilliantly named Judy Jones uh, in this story. And if you see on the right-hand side, uh, our male character is Dexter Green. I don't think his surname is accidental uh, as a hint towards money or greenbacks, as Americans uh, call dollars in, in, in slang. Uh, he made money. It was rather amazing. Before he was 27, he owned the largest string of laundries in this section of the country. Uh, so tremendous success and of course Judy Jones is presented as being able to sniff that out uh, and smell the money uh, and is attracted to Dexter and sets about uh, snaring him. So you can have a little look at some of the quotes there. Uh, a quick one there is that Judy's had an, or a terrible afternoon because there was a man I cared about who told me he was as poor as a church mouse. Uh, it'll make you recall Myrtle Wilson, of course, when she's drunk in Chapter 2 uh, and she's regretting that she ever fell for George who had a borrowed suit and the suit wasn't his when they were getting married. So he knows nothing of quote-unquote breeding was Myrtle's criticism of him. So shades of Myrtle in Judy and Judy in Myrtle. If you look at this second quotation here on the left, are you poor? No, he said frankly. I am probably making more money than any man my age in the Northwest. I know that's an obnoxious remark, but you advised me to start right. Bingo. Okay, they were the magic words in terms of Judy Jones here. There was a pause. Then she smiled and the corners of her mouth drooped at an almost, imp at an almost imperceptible sway brought her closer to him, looking up into his eyes. Uh, then we get mention of lips. Then he saw she communicated her excitement to him lavishly, deeply, with kisses that were not a promise, but a fulfilment. They aroused in him not hunger, demanding renewal, but surfeit that would demand more surfeit. Kisses that were like charity, creating want by holding back nothing at all. So there's the moment that Dexter becomes smitten. Uh, with Judy Jones. If you also look, I think it's in chapter 6 of Gatsby, uh, we see the brilliant quote that his mind would never again romp like a god uh, and the tuning fork of Daisy's voice was sort of the spell, almost like a siren, the mythological sirens who sing and lure male sailors to their doom. We're getting similar ideas here. So let's have a look at how that transports over to the great Gatsby. So here's one of many instances I could have taken from the novel. This is from chapter 5, when uh, Gatsby finally gets Daisy into his house to look at all his splendid things that he has amassed to attract her. Uh, so taking this idea of how women fall in love, in inverted commas, in Fitzgerald's writing, when they see crazy amounts of wealth and... 
uh, sort of wealth beyond belief we have this moment here. Daisy bent her head into the shirts and began to cry stormily. They're such beautiful shirts, she sobbed, her voice muffled in the thick folds. Uh, folds might make you also think of dollar bills or a roll or a wad of money. It makes me sad because I've never seen such such beautiful shirts before. Now, we all like a fine shirt, but to sob uh, stormily over shirts is a little bit strange and excessive, don't you think? So there's Fitzgerald again being satirical uh, and very condemnatory of, yet again, the shallow, superficial nature of women uh, and their emotions are awoken uh, when they can sort of literally roll around in such materialism uh, and extraordinary wealth. She take my money Well, I'm in need Yes, yeah, she's a trifling Friend indeed Oh, she's a gold digger Way over town That digs on me Oh uh. Thirdly, we're looking at the nature of female characters being fickle and incapable of loyalty. So we've got another little moment here from Winter Dreams. So here's Judy Jones yet again. Uh, arrives at a picnic supper with Dexter. Uh, and after supper, she disappeared, likewise in a roadster, with another man. So uh, you're definitely getting the idea of flighty and fickle uh, female characters within Fitzgerald's writing. If you're tying this into context, we can obviously think about the idea of the flapper here. Obviously an affluent version of a flapper girl. Uh, not concerned about propriety, not concerned about loyalty to one partner. Flitting and moving from man to man in this era when women, in terms of the flapper girl, start to exhibit more sexual freedom uh, and break with previous morality in terms of expectations of females and female identity. In a slightly different take on that in The Great Gatsby, we have this quote. It excited him, Gatsby, too, that many men had already loved Daisy. It increased her value in his eyes. He felt their presence all about the house, pervading the air with the shades and echoes of still vibrant emotions. So, strictly speaking here, this phrase, already loved Daisy, strictly speaking, will refer to her time as a debutante, uh, where many suitors and admirers would come calling to Daisy's house to establish their intentions and their eligibility as an eligible bachelor for young Daisy. However, I think Fitzgerald is happy to have slight ambiguity to that phrase as well, uh, and maybe implies something a bit less respectable uh, in terms of already loved Daisy. So, yet again, we're seeing that idea of many male admirers, uh, which the female character is happy, presumably, to have or to court. In a strange sense, though, this is how this part in Gatsby differs from Winter Dreams. Uh, we see a sense of rivalry and competition, which is something we go into lots of detail about in the language video. So... Women are objects, uh, like so many things in this novel. They are items of status and possession. So to win Daisy is actually a massive ego boost for Gatsby in the sense that he has managed to conquer and defeat other male rivals. But there's much more on that in the language video, so check that out too. Okay, so our last area of Fitzgerald's presentation of women uh, is concerning this idea of the bewitching smile or voice, uh, which tends to lead to doom or ruin for their male admirers. Best illustrated, I think, by this. Put a smell on you. Cause you're mine. Thanks for that, Nina. That was lovely. Okay, so we have yet again here uh, Judy Jones. Uh, and at this stage in the story, Dexter is about to settle down, or thinking of settling down with another woman, but who should reappear, of course, at maximum inconvenience to his life, Judy Jones. And she reappears, almost like some kind of Bond villainess. Hello, darling. 
and then all of a sudden the familiar voice at his elbow startled him. Uh, look at all the reference to gold, uh, so there she is metaphorically um, described as a precious material. Um, you also see this idea of a predator here as well. So, when did you get back? He asked casually. He's clearly from Yorkshire now. And then we have come here and I'll tell you about it. So she's luring him in, uh, much like that sort of siren uh, of, sort of Greek mythology, luring him in towards imprisonment and his eventual doom. Uh, he doesn't die in the story, but uh, he is ruined in a sort of a way. If you read the story, you'll know how. Uh, you see enchanted streets, provocative music, definitely alluding to that siren idea here. And just that third paragraph. He, Dexter, was treated to that absurd smile, that preposterous smile, the memory of which at least a dozen men were to carry into middle age. So yet more admirers, yet more men who have been sort of tainted and touched and ruined by the presence of Judy Jones. Then the story moves on and they're on a, a, a motorboat at night on a lake and then you see the instruction from Judy here, go faster, she called, fast as it'll go. There's that idea of that jazz age excess and hedonism that we saw at the motor car earlier, moving at great speed, exhilarating sort of pleasure. Uh, and then we see obediently he, Dexter, jammed the lever forward and the white spray mounted at the bow. When he looked around again, the girl was standing on the, up on the rushing board, her arms spread wide. So, come here and I'll tell you about it. Her arms spread wide. It's almost got that idea of Red Riding Hood and the wolf, with the genders reversed. If you look at the story as well, you'll see reference to her swimming. She's doing sort of a front crawl style, and her pointed elbow sticks out of the water. I definitely think that's Fitzgerald hinting at this kind of shark, predatorial presence in the water. Uh, almost like Spielberg's jaws honing in and focusing in on a prey. Reminiscent of that Gatsby quote, where he hears the tuning fork of Daisy's voice. We get here with Dexter. His heart turned over like the flywheel of the boat. And for the second time, a casual whim gave a new direction to his life. So, as we mentioned before, if this is the lost generation, then the irresistible beauty of these women who pursue affluent males, that gives a sense of direction and purpose to the life of these affluent male characters. Just ending here, we have, Won't you come in? He heard her draw in her breath sharply, waiting. All right. His voice was trembling. I, I, I'll come in. Bless him. He's a lamb to the slaughter, isn't he? So finally, to make the connection with Gatsby, here's that quote I've mentioned previously. Beautiful writing here. Um, when we look at this in the language video and the form and structure video, uh, we'll talk a lot more about this particular quote. But for now, that idea of a spellbinding siren who imprisons and ensnares the affluent male character. We have that here with his mind would never romp again like the mind of God. So in a way, this begins the moment when Gatsby is imprisoned by Daisy. But as we'll talk about in other parts of other videos, he's also ensnared by the concept of Daisy, what she represents. And in a way, she becomes intangible in another way because he is pursuing the ideal of Daisy, the actual flesh and blood of the person or the character called Daisy Faye, eventually Buchanan, fails to live up to that ideal. But more of that in other videos. Okay, that concludes our video on contexts in The Great Gatsby. Please, please, please add your likes. Please add some comments so I don't feel like I'm making these and shouting them into a black hole. It'd be nice to have some interaction, some appreciation, some criticism, some recommendations, anything, basically. And if you're feeling particularly generous, considerate, kind... Uh, subscribe to the channel that would be most marvellous indeed also check out the language video that will make this contextual information come to life and also have a quick 
scroll over to the formal structure video if you feel so inclined.